actors up onto the stage um, to pay uh, special attention um, to Ali Sabanchi. Uh, Ali Sabanchi is um, one of the most famous entrepreneurs uh, in uh, the region. In his region, as you know, he's the founder of uh, Pegasus Airlines, but has been a great friend to us. Uh, I knew that we were friends when I managed to get him to go to a Liverpool Everton football game with me, uh, and I realized that uh, he was a man that spoke my own language. Um, as you know, he will be chair of the, of the work going forward. You'll be staying in this room for our transition to uh, the announcement as to where we're going next year. Um, and so without further ado, I'd like to see if we could welcome uh, our three uh, panelists up onto the stage um, for our next discussion. I think they're still miking up. They're still getting ready. They're probably doing media interviews, but we'll have them ready in just a moment. I will mention one other thing while I've got your ear, while I'm waiting for them to come up to the stage. Um, there will be a group photograph at the end of the transition ceremony this morning. So uh, Slack, Tweak, uh, WhatsApp, email, phone, whatever it is, all your friends and colleagues, have them come in here. We're going to have an awesome group photograph in here at the end of our, uh, at the end of our uh, ceremony this morning. Um, so I do hope that you'll all, uh, all plan to do that. So, Well, um, Larry, I'm going to leave it to you. I guess we've got one other. Uh, is Chris coming? I guess we're getting Chris mic'd up. So without further ado, I'm going to turn over to Larry Jacob of the Coffin Foundation. And a special thank you to Larry, whose foundation has made our work possible. Thank you. You're welcome. They remite me. Sorry. <coughs> how Great are you, Chris? Yeah. Good, Good to see, see you. How are you? You want to see him? Yeah, whatever you like. No, Chris, go all the way down. No. <laughs> I'm comfortable there. Well, thank you all for joining us this morning. Uh, and thank you, Jonathan, for that kind introduction. And I do want to start with that. It's, um, it's really not me that you should be thanking. It's Mr. Ewing Kaufman. And before we dive right into our, our topic, I did want to share a little bit of that story of hope and optimism. You know, this topic can get a little weighty and uh, a, little, a, a little deep. Um, so let's go to hope and optimism for a moment. Uh, Mr. Kaufman, he was 33 years old, had a family was treated unfairly by his boss, started his company in his basement, named it Marion Labs because he didn't want people to think it was one person running the show. He grew that from his basement to a multi-billion dollar pharmaceutical company. You know, it's his legacy that everybody in this room and beyond this room is really living today. Uh, and we're really thankful to be part of this uh, remarkable gathering in South Africa. So thank you. Yeah, as you heard uh, Victor, Victor Wong talk yesterday, um, our focus at the foundation is really about delivering that optimism and message that we need to eliminate <coughs> barriers for entrepreneurs at every level. And our work focuses on you know, developing enhanced learning uh, opportunities for entrepreneurs, working side by side with entrepreneurs to create great communities to thrive and also eliminating those, um, those barriers and market gaps that cause so many people to stop in their tracks. And the reason why we do that is we really believe that entrepreneurs are the engine of the economy. More research is coming out and the closer, um, the, the, the closer that we get to more uh, a definitive answer that entrepreneurs and entrepreneurship increase productivity, increase jobs, increase overall well-being within the communities that they serve. So the importance of this topic goes well beyond the individual entrepreneur. It really is about delivering that message of hope. You know, at the foundation, our, our focus is, tends to be in the United States, but we started uh, Global Entrepreneurship Week and support uh, this Congress because we know we can learn from each other, we can share those lessons, and we can make a difference in delivering those opportunities across the world. And I thank you again for your time. So with that, we're going to start off and uh, really get to our panel and talk through this topic about the Middle East and North, North Africa and how entrepreneurship can spread and, and bring that promise um, to those areas. So with that, let's dive right in. Both of you have a unique perspective on this region uh, and our current reality and what the future might look like. So the audience has your bios. Let's, let's start with you, Chris, and, and tell a little bit more something that might be off the bio that gives you a perspective on what's happening. So look, I mean, the Middle East, um, first of all, the talk about the Middle East is like talking about Africa. It's not one right. thing. It's many different countries with great diversity and culture, uh, which is a mistake that Americans typically make. And the, the second corollary mistake 
Americans make is that the Middle East is one narrative. We think about one thing, we hear about one thing, and we divide an entire region by some very terrible and tragic failed states, and we don't look at some obvious, unobvious things that are happening, which are very profound, which everyone in this room takes for granted. And, and I had my own journey seven or eight years ago <coughs> where I've been across emerging markets all my life and the tech companies I've run, I've outsourced tech uh, to every emerging market, but it was only about seven years ago that I went for the first time to see this thousands of extraordinary young Arabs, women and men who are just building and solving great problems the way everyone in the room here did it. And honestly, my reaction to it was embarrassment of myself mm -hmm. because I sh I've been all over the world, I've seen what amazing people are doing all over the world. And, and somehow I was enough in the narrative that, that it couldn't be happening in the Middle East, but of course it was happening. And subsequent to that in the, in the journey of the last seven years, and I've been over there many times to many different countries, I, I am seeing such a rapid grow, growth of amazingly gifted entrepreneurs using technology in very creative ways to solve enormous problems, not only for the region, but I think progressively emerging market to emerging market and then to the growth world. And so I'm deeply, deeply hopeful, and it's all because of what you said before, which is the, what the new generation is doing with the, the capabilities to entrepreneurship. Right. Ali, allow me to start referring back to Mr. Kaufman. You know, you said at age 33, he was mistreated by his boss. Probably that boss deserves a great round of applause. <laughs> <laughs> really. Yes. Because without, without either being mistreated or misunderstood or underutilized, you never really understand your true potential, where you can go. My story, and also what you said, Chris, about being embarrassed. You don't have to be that embarrassed because it's a two-way street. We, in this part of the world, also have to be better present ourselves and explain ourselves in a more coherent way, as opposed to having five people with six different opinions talking about the Middle mm -hmm. East, having a view about the Middle East. Uh, what's not on my CV? Well, uh, I left uh, a family business when I was 34 years old. And you know, yesterday Jeff Hoffman mentioned 87 billion mm -hmm. US, right? Not yeah, yeah. US, price yes. Right? Okay. I was hoping it was uh, maybe some other currency. <laughs> uh, when I first met him, it was 16 billion. Okay, and that wasn't so long ago. When I left my family business, it was about 10 billion. And billion in our part of the world means more than billion in your part of the world, mm -hmm. right? But I quickly understood that that billion, multi-billion dollar business had no appeal to me and I could not give back. And one of the ways I learned was late 1990s, we managed to buy an ISP. Does anybody remember what an <laughs> ISP does? Connectivity was key then. Right. Content wasn't there. Connectivity was key, right. right? We bought an ISP into this multinational conglomerate for 25 million. And I managed to lose my first 25 million mm -hmm. in this deal. I was happy because the major competitor to us lost 72 million, right? So I, I heard the other day, uh, one of the lieutenants to Jack Welsh lost 100 million, handed in his resignation, and Jack Welsh said, you can't resign, I just spent 100 million dollars educating you. <laughs> right, so it's what you learn, right. as opposed to how much you lose. So I don't have that 25 million in my CV. <laughs> it, it's funny that he uses that language, because um, Reid Hoffman just came to the Middle East for the first time. He went to talk about startups and all. <coughs> he said there's this sort of idea that Silicon Valley and, and entrepreneurs love failure. And he right. said, we don't love failure. And all of us in the room, this room do not love failure. We love learning. That's, that's right. right. And I think this is exactly the point that he's making in that story, which is something we all have to keep in mind. Right. Well, sp well speaking of learning, Ali, just over the last few years, your country has seen a lot of changes. You know, as you, as you started your second, third, you know, Growth second areas, period. right? That's right. Uh, what, have, what have you seen change specifically? Well, just for those of you who didn't see my bio, I'm from Turkey. Beautiful country. And uh, have you been there? Has anybody been to Istanbul? Many times. Who's coming next year? Okay, who's bringing their wives and husbands? <laughs> what about girlfriend? Anyway, I'm not gonna. <laughs> okay. You're raising your hand at everything, man. Uh, <laughs> So what's changed in the last 10, 10 12 years? Yeah. Uh, I mean, we talked about the technology, mm -hmm. the
digitalization. We talked about mobile today. I remember I, I was lucky enough to be part of a, a retail business, an airline. I call it the retail business. And I remember this, you know, for the first time in a, in a TV commercial, and we used to use TV commercials, okay, not, not social media. There was no such, such thing. You know the pack shot at the end of the TV commercial where they say, you know, call this call center or enter this uh, website to buy a ticket? For the first time in my country's history, we put the web address. Go to that web address to buy the ticket. And we had almost all the agents protesting us, mm. the traditional channels mm -hmm. of sale. So I, I said to them, you have two choices. I am not the one who's developing the technology, but I'm not going to stand in front of it. Either you follow or you have a smaller business three, five years from now. Right. And this is what's happened. In, in one of the businesses that we have, the airline, 60% of our, all of our sales are through the net, one third of which are through the mobile. Right. You know? So this is a major change. The, co mm -hmm. the consumer is also realizing that through the increase of competition in various sectors, they can get uh, better quality products with lower prices, and they have access to products over the mobile. Right. Well, uh, Ali, that's an interesting point. Yeah, uh, cutting out that, that middle provider also potentially could be you know, really disruptive to those middle providers who may or may not lose their jobs. And, and Chris, you, know, you've, you literally wrote the book on this uh, <laughs> in the Middle East. But you know, talk a little bit more about that disruption. And you know, is technology disruption you know, really a good or a bad thing based off of the region? I mean, it's not just about the regions anywhere in the world. People sure. like to talk yeah. about and simplify many things in life about is it a good thing or a bad thing. And the answer is it can be both depending on who you are and where you are. But the net positive of access to technology, if you look back over the last 100 mm -hmm. years, and in my view, you'll look over the next 100 years, is profoundly uh, going to be of value overall. I mean, if you think about any time in history anywhere in the world, what we have available to us doesn't mean it has universal access enough, but what is coming available to us in, in healthcare uh, innovation and disruption and technology mm -hmm. Uh, and the ways that we can teach each other and learn each other through platforms in ways that you and I couldn't even talk about three years ago is profound. I think the problem is it is disruptive and it is moving faster than ever before and we have to be sensitive to those dynamics. We have to have serious conversations about it, not dragging to look back in any way but moving forward. And one of the, the real cliches, this is true very much, I hear it all the time in the Middle East but I hear it everywhere, is that technology is a job killer. And in point of fact, if you really look at it, and if you think about technology in a broader term, it creates not only new jobs, but platforms create multiplier jobs around them. So you have a company like Souq.com now that is literally the largest e-commerce player in the Arab world. Tens of thousands of businesses that never had digital reach are now extending their customer reach, which means they're hiring more people and getting bigger in and of itself. As importantly, I can name 20 or 30 very good entrepreneurs who have left Souq.com who are now kicking off their own enterprises right. that are going to become very large overall. So we tend to look at it as a, an isolated zero-sum game, mm -hmm. and in point of fact, new jobs get created, new skills get developed, and the multiplier effect can be something that really is very powerful. Great. No, no. May I just uh, try something, and then see if you agree? You know, jobs is one thing, it's very important, socially as well, economically, but also the consumer is important, right? Right. So not everybody produces, but everybody consumes. So in that perspective, we have to look out for the consumer's good, in my opinion, to make it sustainable. And so how would you answer his question about the future for consumers based right. on technology? It'll be cheaper for them to buy. Right. Easier, less friction. Less friction, mm -hmm. and it'll be more efficient. 100 units of, a, let's say a product that costs 100 units, delivering that to the customer will be a lot less portion of that 100 units. So in my opinion, we cannot, we cannot, st even if we wanted to stop and no, stop the technology, right, anyway. this is right. too, too late. But, but this is a very good point about the power of the, to the consumer. And, and the challenge to that oftentimes is, you know, the government can be supportive of that or not, you know, and get in the way of that, you know, create more friction and sometimes create less. You know, from your perspective, what can governments in the region do uh, to be more supportive of entrepreneurship? What's one thing that they might yeah, be able uh, to do? You know, I don't want to be... Uh, how do you say, uh, uh, polishing my government or Turkish mm -hmm. government currently. But one of the great things that they've done, in my opinion, and in the opinion of most of the people in the ecosystem, is that they've opened the way, right. okay? From tax breaks to qualified individual investors, okay? To having funds of funds 
investing in startups. Okay? One of the things, uh, the, what I see the governments, and I've seen this in my country, and it will always continue, is a struggle between the populist approach, which is the creation of jobs, mm -hmm. or the protection approach to state-owned Enterprise. companies, enterprises. Right. So there's, in English they say, caught in between a rock and a hard place, <laughs> right? right? So think of that as the rock. And on the other side is benefit to the consumer, which mm -hmm. at the end of the day wins you votes, right? Right. Huh? So in my, in, in, in my country there's been some struggle on this, but we I think we're slowly finding the right path. One of the things, in my opinion, governments should not do, they should not be investing in companies. In, in companies. I agree with you. Right. Because they don't have the, right. the know-how, in my opinion. Look, this question drives me crazy, I have to tell you, in a lot of respects, because uh, I think at the end of the day, there's not only so much that governments can do to, for the ecosystems that are evolved mm -hmm. overall, but the irony is the very problems that people in this room are solving right now, bettering education, bettering healthcare, right. bettering infrastructure, allowing uh, economies to rise, ironically actually can help government in a very mm -hmm. powerful way, and yet so many leadership, usually of a certain generation, doesn't realize. They think of it as a threat or they want to play sure. last century's game, and it is the rare group of people that sort of say this is something to be leveraged bottom up because everyone will benefit and we will be a better government customer service by that That's partnership. Right. And mm -hmm. interestingly enough, in the Arab world right now, everyone should be looking carefully at the UAE. Right. Because it, you know, a lot of times people think about the UAE and Dubai in particular as a sort of little uh, uh, strange oasis of wealth creation and physical growth of cities and everything else, and it's a spectacular physical thing, and it's not without challenges, but this is a country who strategically, top down and bottom up, with ministers now, a third of whom are women, mm -hmm. who, where many of the deputy and sub-ministers are in their 30s, are spending 16 hours a day thinking about how can we truly celebrate the last drop of oil? That's how right. can we be an environment, not only great in and of itself, but a network effect of talent from around the world that can come and do things very powerfully? And so look, it's not perfect because nothing is mm -hmm. perfect, but that is really le leveraging the potential of the bottom up in a powerful way. And, and we're gonna see surprises. So I have to tell you, it's way too early to tell and there, there are many challenges overall, but there, there are uh, credible signs along these lines happening in Saudi Arabia. Okay. This is something you and I would not have been talking about right. quite as openly two years ago. But if, if the Gulf can be a model, not only for the Gulf, but mm -hmm. for the Middle East and for other growth markets, and I know the vision is to be very globally minded overall, these are, these are models which are scalable. Right. And it really does base on the idea that technology is not something to be avoided or managed. Right. It is to be unleashed to collective benefit. Right. Great. To the, extent, to the extent that the price of oil, you know, some of these com countries make their budgets based on $80 oil. Exactly. Now mm -hmm. it's below, I think it's around 50 or below 50, and they're forced into this position. But, In another group, sorry, go ahead. No, no, go ahead. In another group of countries where there's no such natural resources, right. they have another motivation, like in my country. Every year, 800,000 to 1 million university graduates come into the workforce, yeah. okay? To be able to, like you said, unleash the, the energy, you have to liberate and find right. homes for these guys or girls to go to. Right. I'd, look, I'd like to change the line that's been repeated here, not that it's wrong, the data is the new oil is fine, sure. but, but let me tell you, you know what the new oil is? Human capital that's right. is the new oil. That's right. Intellectual capital. That that's right. is that's the right. new that's right. oil, that's exactly right. and that's what's represented in this conference yeah. and what's happening, I can <coughs> tell you, across the Arab world. And that being unleashed, I think, is, is proud, profound, and those who don't take advantage of it are missing a historic opportunity. Well, I want to dig into that a little bit. The, the Kauffman Foundation actually has a dual mission in entrepreneurship and education. And for a long time, we saw those two things as actually separate. And they were actually physically separate within our building. Over time, they become closer and closer together. And you heard that strain yesterday talking about how do we get the next generation educated in a way that's going to meet tomorrow's workforce. We see these disruptions. You know, the future is human capital in my mind, and that is the, 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 the new oil. But what can we see in the region? Do we see any experiments with that? Do we see you know, project-based learning? Do we see some things that can point to you know, those 800,000 being prepared for not just tomorrow, but what comes five years from now, 10 years from now? Yeah, I mean, let me, I mean, entrepreneurs don't like to look back, right. but I have to tell you, there's a, several Turkish proverbs. I thought you was a proverb, Mide. Yeah. Proverbs, proverbs, okay? Yeah. Mm -hmm. One says, don't bring a new habit into an old village, huh. not an old metropolitan or not an old big village, you know. So allow this bit, this to be mine, small 
village and don't bring any new habits. This is what we heard going through primary school, high school. I heard this when I was 32 years old in my previous job. Uh, so we're starting from there. And the education system is not at all perfect. Education system is not at all perfect in the US either. Right. You know? But I think we have to do two things. One, this fear of failure. You know, we have to celebrate those who try. You know, think of, I, I, I read somewhere that this, this some young, young gentleman, Jack Ma, applied to your school 10 times. Yeah, right. One time rejected, two, three, four, five, six, that's persistence, right? So trying, and I'm sure they're sad that he's not an alma mater. Uh, yes. They probably are. And the second thing we have to do, so failure is, should be eliminated, the fear of failure. And the th second thing we have to do in our part of the world, in my opinion, is we have to realize that the population is not just made out of men. So it's men and women, right? Uh, and culturally, we, we need to bring the, the female part of the population more into the workforce. Currently in my country, I think the, 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 the unemployment rate is about 10, 11% overall. Mm -hmm. Unemployment of the young is about 20%. Unemployment of the women is about 25% higher than that. Right? So if we can eliminate the fear of failure and also bring women into, the, right. into this ecosystem. Right. Chris, a quick Very point. quick, because I know yeah. we, we want to wrap up overall. Just, as a quick aside, by the way, The Economist said that in the Arab world, one third of the entrepreneurs are women, which I can tell you dwarfs anything. Nowhere near good enough, but dwarfs Silicon Valley, right. so we should keep That's that right. in mind as something powerful. And just look, I, I was in Iran uh, a year ago, and every young person I did took out their mobile phone and showed me courses they were taking from around the world that was available to them. There's a company out of Egypt called Nafham, which is supplemental education to Egypt and Saudi Arabia and other schooling programs right now, all delivered on a mobile device. Over 30 million classes have been viewed in 18 months overall. Mm -hmm. So there's technology that allows us to leapfrog in certain ways. There is going to be other kinds of opportunities to look at education around curriculum, around STEAM, not just science, technology, engineering, and math, but also art and design, which I think is very important. The most critical factor of all is not to, to wipe right our hands together and say it's going to take a generation to fix. We have to look at it now. And the biggest message is all this stuff is secondary to people being taught to ha have critical thinking. That's right. That is, to me, the most important thing. If you can question and get out of rote learning and learn to yeah. question and to tinker and then bring the other skills and use technology to layer onto it, we will get there. Great. And on that note, let's thank our panelists today. Thank you. Ali, thank Chris, you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.